mainly in life we're looking at how do I make a life worth reliving and uh, retirement worth having. And when I talk about this, I talk about it in a way that makes sense to me, but it might not make sense to you, and I can't help that. The truth is that when I'm looking for how do I move forward in my life after great cyber attack and incredible personal loss, I only have to look to the Lord. And in your case, I don't know who you look to. You probably look to your family or to your children or to the loved ones in your life. But when a man goes through loss, he's looking for the people who are not going to lie to him, who are not going to manipulate him, who are not going to try to control his life, and who are not going to try and take away his life through selfish gains and selfish means. In life, we have moments of time to make all the difference in the world for people. And the truth is, if you're making a difference for someone, then you're making an impact. If you're sitting on the sidelines and going, yeah, I'm not going to really help with that, it means that you're not caring about God's house. Now, when we talk about God's house in this particular audio series, we're really talking about the life of the Lord. The life of the Lord as it flows through you, as it flows around your life, as it flows into your life, and it gives you life and a force that allows you to know that there is still magic in the land. And when I talk about magic, sometimes people think I'm a pagan, and I suppose there are parts of my life that might seem that way to people. I wear certain things, I do certain things, and I do it all based on my own religious beliefs. And when someone monkeys with my things and puts and ruins my shoes and destroys my rights to have a library card and takes away things of my property in the night, it sort of shows that people are not paying attention to the law. In America, we have laws that are important. We have constitutional laws, we have those federal laws, and then we, of course, have some things that are going on locally for us. But the reality is that international treaties are what really should be governing our life as American citizens. And in those international treaties, we have a human rights declaration, if you will, that went into effect in around 1948. There was 300 to 400 countries, depending on what source you look at, who participated in establishing those human rights. And those human rights are 30 in all, 30 articles, if you will, that establish what a human being should be entitled to in the world. A part of that international human rights are the freedoms and expressions of women because around the globe women are not always given the same status as men. At the same time, there is religious freedom and freedom of mobility acts that allow a person to move freely through their own home country without being stalked, hazed, or harassed by any police force or militia that is being put into place. That is something that is a part of international treaties. There's also a freedom of information sort of act that allows people to access information, to re do research, and to use telecommunication tools in a way that allows them to contact loved ones, to get in touch with people they haven't seen in a while, and to try and reach out and establish new business opportunities for themselves to create a revenue stream, an income, if you will, and opportunities to live freely in the land. When we're looking at how do we help people who are impoverished, we have to look around us. There's an elderly couple that I run into on occasion at the library, and I am worried for them because I can see the impoverishment of the body of the wife. I worry she might be riddled with illness, but I also realize they might be malnutrition involved and that there's not enough food in the house, that the retirement funds are waning, and that they're always looking for coupons for how can they eat. I gave them an information about a Thursday evening meal in Noblesville because it's a hearty supper, and there are good people there who care for those. Afterwards, there's kind of an informal sort of... Um, conversational aspect of the Lord's house in which people talk about God and how it plays out in their life. And while it's still a fledgling ministry and getting off the ground, it, there are some valuable points and some heated discussions sometimes between myself for sure and the pastor running it, but definitely the people in the population who are regular attenders are valuing what's going on there because it's real dialogue about God. Now in life we have most of the time to help people and to raise people up. There are many ministries in the community for helping the impoverished is somewhat true and yet somewhat not true. They all provide food, which is great, but trying to manage what day to go to what ministry to find what food is difficult. And if you're stuck to eating out of cans because of people tainting food in the land, they fail to recognize the Food and Drug Administration Act about that if you're working in a restaurant, you don't have the right to monkey with someone's food or beverage. Yet we have restaurateurs who will do so. They either do so to get rid of a client or to say, hey, you stink, or literally to just decide to be in control of someone's life. We have to be cautious of those things because we have a lot of foreigners coming to the country who experience those things on a regular basis in their countries, and they don't recognize the fact that American law does not allow that. The truth is probably the treaties of governing their country doesn't allow that either, but that doesn't prevent the militia from violating those laws. We've seen plenty of films that are good, bad, and indifferent about what goes on in impoverished countries. 
America is thankfully not an impoverished country, and yet there are plenty of people who are living close to the edge in paycheck-to-paycheck -paycheck life. When I talk about these things, I'm not talking as a financial planner. I'm not talking about anything other than marketing people, programs, and products. And the reality is that in order to make a life, we have to be able to market ourselves in a way that makes sense to other people. Also, we have to be able to market ourselves away from the people who are trying to destroy our life and our right to have an income. When we make those decisions about who we will and won't allow in our life, we have to decide, did we make that decision wholeheartedly? Did we pray on it with God? Did we utilize any tools of divination to make sure that we've not made a mistake? And openly, are we really hanging with the right people in the right crowds of our life? You see, there's love languages for all people, and everyone has a different love language. For some people, it's time in. For others, it's food. For other people, it is literally money. For other people, it's something else. And you can do your own reading of Gary Chapman's work in that realm of the five love languages. But the reality is that sometimes we don't know what the love language is for someone, and other times we just have to say, you know what, I'm going to love no matter what. In life, we have moments of time to make a difference for someone is something that I'm always talking about because I know that one moment of time can change a life. And I know that there are many moments that can destroy a life. You see, if you participate in the saying no crowd, in the I'm not participating in this crowd, in the I'm not going to go there crowd, in the I'm not going to help crowd, in the I'm not going to respond crowd, I'm not going to do anything that the Lord would do through me crowd, it means you're really not thinking about what America is supposed to be as a land of love, liberty, and opportunities. You see, in order to have opportunities, we have to have people caring on other people. We have to be able to share a conversation like I did in the middle of the night at a steak and shake with a woman who works there who was quite kind to me in moments when I had absolutely no funds in the pocket. And when I had funds, I went back in loyalty to show my appreciation for the fact that they allowed me to sit down when it was cold and they had compassion in their hearts as third shift workers for how hard it is to be outside in the cold or in the rain. The, the woman is looking for a better uh, work opportunity during the day so that she has time with her children in the afternoons and the evening and there has to be someone in this community who can offer her that but who can also offer her some training in terms of what she needs to know about social graces and not interrupting a boss and not overstepping men's rights to talk and other things like that we also have to have people who are loving enough to say hey that works in this particular situation but it doesn't exactly work in the new situations you're trying to go into in terms of earning a higher wage when we have someone caring and thoughtful and those sort of things in our life, it's amazing what we can accomplish. When a man is trying to reestablish his life, he's looking for strategic alliances with some of the smartest minds so that he knows how to go forward in life. He's also looking for someone who will stand with him and fight a good fight if he needs to be in that position at all from people who are violently attacking his life or harming his right to work. In the moments of time, we have people who don't recognize their roles. I talk often about the three R's rules, roles, and responsibilities. The rules are usually related to the international treaties and the U.S. Constitution, in truth, above any other rule that we might have in our workplace. There's, of course, HR manuals that tell us what our rules and right, rules are in working for a company, what we may and may not do. There's always someone, though, who wants to overstep those rules, who wants to demand and command another person's life because they don't know what they're about, they've never taken the time to ask them what they're about, and they literally are violently attacking a person's rights to even sit down. When I talk about this, I'm talking about a situation that I experienced last evening that literally I finally found a place just to sit down and not be hassled by people walking by. Just to sit down and relax and rest my mind, my heart, my soul, and my physical being. Walking in the community is quite difficult. There's not enough seats around town for the elderly. I, of course, have people who are trying to put plays on my life, and I recognize them within seconds, and some of them succeed, and some of them fail horribly, but that's because they have no social graces, and they have not worked in the business community. They don't know how to play out their life in a way that makes sense, and when there's a natural timing, and when they try to force what's your name and other things, we automatically know that they are not who they say they are. Openly, I was approached by a male couple, and that's okay with me. I'm going to regard them like I would regard any other couple. They made a commitment to each other, allegedly, and I'm going to honor that commitment. They were married, allegedly, and I'm going to regard that commitment. But it's not my right to sit in judgment of other people. That's God's job. God will judge whether or not they did the right thing in terms of their selection of their partner and whether or not they are truly partnered at all. You see, a lot of people like to put a play on someone to see how someone will respond to something, to test them, to see what they do, to see what they're about. And the truth is, it's not my job to be tested. It's my job to keep moving forward in life and looking for that next path, that next opportunity.
and it's annoying that you utilize equipment and it tries to shut itself off on you in the midst of utilization. But that's okay. Now in life, we have moments of time to tell people how we feel. I've been trying desperately to tell one person how much I care about them, and I keep get, getting impeded by technology or by librarians or by other people who are violating my rights. I don't like it one bit. And I don't like that I have birth family who thought they would just monkey in all my contacts and interfere with my right to gain help outside of the birth family. It's annoying as hell. At my age, it's beyond out of control. But when I talk about this honestly, who's going to listen? I also make recordings in a studio that I borrow in the library here in either Fishers or sometimes occasionally in Noblesville. But the reality is that those audio files might be 30 minutes long, and then I go and I upload them. They are 30 minutes, and I come back to them and find them at 20 minutes. Because some librarian somewhere in some technology lab thinks they have the right to edit or modify what I put together, and they don't. That is a violation of intellectual property law, in a way. Because it's stealing my right to decide what I'm going to say in freedom of speech concepts underneath the First Amendment. Now, does everyone get that I'm about law these days? That's okay. If you like that, great. If you don't, sorry. It'll eventually work itself out. But in moments of time, we have moments of time to say, hey, I know that guy, I'm going to help him. We also have moments of time to say, hey, I'm not sure about what's going on here, but I might know somebody who can help you. You see, America used to be about helping people. It's sort of what the 60s were about. It's certainly about the 70s movements and women li women's live movements and all the other movements that have come since then, civil liberties movements that have come since then have been about. It's about reaching out and helping someone, moving them forward in life. The current politicians are talking about a lot of things. A lot of things that some of us care about and some of us don't. I haven't seen a huge uh, slide towards one person or another, but everybody's still working out their shtick because they didn't go into it with a plan. Or they went into it with a plan and then they got their money because they look like a GQ doll and their wife is cute. I don't like that. I expect someone to be articulate, ready to become president, and acting like a president already. We all know those historic moments of time when someone lost the capability to be president because of how they behaved in a moment of time of joy or of expression that made them look unpresidential. I don't remember who the man was, but I remember that moment. He did some sort of a yip yip parade kind of thing, and I didn't think that was so bad because he was being authentic in his emotions. But other people did, and so they moved him out of the nomination towards presidency. Now we have a lot of women who've thrown their hat in the ring, and I talk about that regularly, and the truth is they're pretty well prepared to be president. They're probably better prepared than some of the men in the fact that they have served people throughout their entire lives, and they've participated in human rights dignities more than atrocities. And that makes them better prepared and better looking in terms of a presidency, I believe, because we have to get back to a loving nation. We have to get to the point where theft is no longer an issue here. And the only way we get to the point where theft is no longer an issue is in two ways, where we raise, raise the wages of workers, by doing something like lateral compensation, where companies simply say, here's our profit source, here's what we're setting aside for employee salaries, and we're just going to divide them up as equally as we possibly can so that everyone makes a good living, everyone drives a reasonable car, everyone has a good mode of transportation, everyone can afford the atrocious gas prices and how we're getting really ripped off at the, at the tank, and openly, everyone can afford food, their future, and setting money aside for retirement. A lot of companies don't want to provide benefits anymore. And I think, great, but who's going to provide for you in your old age or those people that you didn't want to provide for? So that's something they need to think about. They might be providing benefits for their executives, but guess who's going to be wiping their butt in the middle of the night when they can't do it anymore? The hourly worker or the wage earner and salary man that they did not give benefits to because of their selfishness in terms of financing the world. Now, when I talk about these things, I'm talking about real life. Let's face it, every day we get up, we go off to a job or go off to a job hunt, we eat two to uh, six meals a day depending on our body physical needs and our cellular health requirements, and those things impact our life. We interact with certain people, we go to certain places looking for assistance or counsel, and those people are responsible to their jobs, so that gets us to the concept of roles. But if you have a role as a manager of a shop, you are not representing the president of the entire organization or international company. So you better be clear on what your boundaries are as in your job. That your job is simply to do the right thing by people, to not accuse them of things that you can't prove, to not uh, assimilate or say that they're doing something wrong, and to not participate in community mobbing, stalking, and other harassments 
which would be a violation of international world treaties, making you look like a monster. Now in life, we also have responsibilities. Those responsibilities are to a job. We don't always have to like the patrons or the customers or the clients of our companies. We hopefully will find some of those things, and there certainly are rights to decide who is and who isn't a fit for our programming or for our services. But in truth, people have a lot of needs in this world, and if you're working in a public-oriented institution, you don't have the right to make that decision. You don't have the right to say, these people are okay, but that person's not okay. You don't have the right to do that. I've experienced that by a couple of organizations that are run basically and funded by the state, and that's not right. And when I talk about my life, I share with you experiences. But the truth is, anything that has happened to me can totally happen to you. Absolutely, 100% happen to you. You might feel differently about it if it was happening to you than you might feel about it that it's happening to me. And I'm making these audio files as my own uh, posterior mortem kind of situation, if you will. But at the same time, I'm making them to try and help educate people on what their roles, rules, and responsibilities are in life. If you work a job, you represent that company more than you represent yourself. We have to get to that place where we learn about that concept from Asia, where in Asia, you represent your company and your department before you represent yourself. Once we put that in place, people will do less stupid things that put their companies in legal liability. I've had to remind several people in the last week of what their role is in their position, that they don't have the right to monkey with someone's technology because it's cybercrime and other things. They don't have the, monkey, the right to monkey with someone's mind through audio files and involving people who are monsterizing and monopolizing and destroying lives. So in life, we have moments of time to show up for people. And it's probably your moment to show up for someone somewhere. I encourage you to do so because at some point, that love and that patience of that person of waiting for you to show up is going to turn and is going to go, okay, what did you do to destroy my life? And then you end up in liability. In my opinion, everything is love or liability. You see, if you love on someone, then there's very little in liability. But if you start to distinguish that someone is worthy and another person is not worthy and all that sort of stuff, you end up in liability. So this has been an interesting audio cast, I suppose, a hopefully educational one about three R's, and hopefully moves at least one life forward in the concept of you either have love in your heart or liability to deal with. Thanks for listening.